Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. continuing on our module on uh, pigment and that is our third module and third week and in this one we have already started talking about the cave sites of Ajanta where there have been many of the caves and many of them have been painted. So the continuing on this discussion of how there have been those painted surfaces. So if you can remember we have already addressed that in the uh, in uh, talking about the Gandhara sculptures in which there have been some of the remnants of the stucco structure um, the stucco material as well as some of the pigments which give us a sense of how those images those sculptures were painted. Now in terms of Ajanta what we find that I mean similar to that there have been lime plasters onto the this excavated caves and on the top of that there had been the paints which are, were added to that. Now more some of the examples for example that we have here and this comes from the next phase of the paintings in Ajanta or the cave excavation in Ajanta and that will be between like I mean 4th and 6th century and here what we find that there have been already the kind of developments which were there from the 1st, 2nd and 1st century BC. From there, there have been more and more advancement in terms of uh, the making of the sculpture and uh, also like I mean their anatomical details and expressions and everything else in them and then how the painting technologies and also their, their implementations they have also been changed and transformed over time. Now the image that we have in the left side of the screen and here we have that is from uh, cave 4 and it is one of the largest caves in Ajanta and uh, it is also an unfinished monastery. So in this one what we have that I mean how this rock uh, structures they have been carved and then they were not only just made into these columns and uh, pillars and the ceiling but uh, intricate details they were also added to this particular um, caves it uh, and cave 4 is not the only one where it was done there are many other caves in which we find similar kind of activities and in with this ones what we in this one what we have that there is a seated image of uh, there is a mighty and monumental image of Buddha that we find and he is seated on this um, high seat which is a marker of his divinity and um, in, in the bottom of that we have there are two deers and then there is also a representation of a will. So deer park in Sarnath and then the will that also stands for um, turning the will of law or Dharma Chakra Pavartana that is the that is something that is very much important in, in the lifespan of Buddha which became a very important event in the Buddhist art and architecture that we find to be uh, here as well. Now in these sculptures that I mean this this sculptures which were carved out of the uh, the living rock in the site of Ajanta we mostly find that the sculptures either dis, uh, show the images of Buddha and that started after the first century AD or during first century AD and later times and then we have that I mean flanked by the attendants or divine figures and so on the celestial beings and but it is not many of the other narrative scenes which were being carved out of stone. So these are the central images which were carved out of stone, the images of Buddha or mostly the images of veneration where people can pray or where people can pay their homage but not the other narratives which are perhaps belonging to the Jataka tales and the other uh, events of life from uh, Buddha. Now what we have here significant is that there are some of the traces of the lime plaster as well as paints on this particular figure. Here we can see some of the traces of the red pigment and perhaps something that is yellow ochre or yellowish. Now here also we find little bit of the red pigment that is existing here and red should not be a surprise because Buddha had also been associated with the red uh, robe 
so the his monk's robe which was basically it's a it's a piece of cloth which uh, covered one of his shoulder and then like leaving the other shoulder empty and it flowed until his um, ankles and so this is the kind of robe we are talking about so that is the reason we find that the entire robe is perhaps been painted in red and then the color that is uh, yellowish in tone that can be the color of his skin. So this is these are some of the traces that we have and which also um, goes along with the iconographical traits those were already established during this time about Buddha. Now the other features that we also find that I mean if this is this is one of the places where we find the the remains of the paints. So this is this is something that that also makes us think that most of the sculptures that we have in in the cave here in Ajanta and many other different sites in the Indian subcontinent and not only just in the Buddhist context but in Buddhist, Jain and Hindu context many of those sculptures were actually painted. So that is the reason why this is important for us to think that even though today we see many of the sculptures in this archaeological sites as well as in the museums, they are uh, totally uh, you know unpainted and there, there are no other pigments and so on that we find. But that was certainly not the case if we see them when they were built because this was a common practice across the Indian subcontinent to cover the, uh, on the sculptures of made of stone with uh, lime plaster or the other this, this soft material which will allow people to, to uh, paint on the top of them or to have little more of the details which cannot be achieved on stone. And so this, this is a practice that persisted um, in various parts of the Indian subcontinent. Now the other traces of the pigments that we find there are in the upper registers of this of the caves and for example here that we have in the ceiling. So for example when we have this in the roof those areas are not really disturbed by the people who will go inside and uh, perform their duties or like the visitors or travelers and so on. They are uh, essentially out of the reach of human beings. Uh, it, these are high on the ceiling and that is the reason perhaps that I mean they have survived until today. And there even in the those areas like in the cave 10, uh, we find that I mean there are some of the um, examples of the earlier times like for example from the 2nd century to 1st century BC those, those paintings are there and they also coexisted with the ones which were added later on between 5th and 6th century AD and that is also identified with the Gupta Vakataka period. So Gupta period that is the time which has also uh, been very significant in the history of northern India and in the Deccan in the area where we find that Ajanta and Ellora this, this sites are situated. So those areas were under the rule of the Vakataka dynasty. So that is the reason what we call it that the Gupta Vakataka uh, period and um, their, their um, art making in these sites. Now if you remember that we have already said something about um, superimposed images or how there is one image and that is coexist with the images those are added later times. So some of the, th this one example that we studied from the site of Vimbetka and we can see similar kind of tendency in the site here in KF10 as well. So, there have been some painted uh, images in KF10 from the 2nd uh, and 1st century BC and from there we also find that some of the images were repainted and in some cases we find that those images coexisted with the images which were added much later in the uh, 5th and 6th century AD and so on. So that, that gives us a sense uh, of how um, this, this tendency towards superimposing images or redecorating places of worship or of high importance that persisted in the prehistoric times but also in Ajanta and we will find this kind of examples all across in the Indian subcontinent in the later times as well. So from there I wanted to uh, introduce this other material and that is the pigment blue.
Now, we, in the earlier paintings, like for example, the images from 2nd and 1st century BC, in Ajanta, we do not really have much of the image, much of the use of blue. And of course, that when we also spoke about the images in Bimbetka and some of the pigment remains that is there in the Jogimara caves in, in Chhattisgarh and so on, we do not really have much of the use of blue. So, in the Indian subcontinent, we do have the indigo that is that is used for making blue pigment. However, the plant based pigments work very differently from the mineral based pigments. The plant based pigments they work very well, they bind well with uh, fabric or textile, whereas the mineral based pigments they work well for making the murals or also working on paper. So, that is the reason we do not really see that indigo, even though indigo was used in the Indian subcontinent for uh, a long time, but indigo was never used for doing this kind of mural paintings at least in Ajanta and some of the earlier sites. Now, from where this blue pigment then came from? Now, this is something that we find that uh, this blue pigment and one of the uh, most celebrated blue pigment that, that came from that is uh, lapis lazuli or lapis lazuli and it is, a, it is again it is a mineral source and that is something that is not really found much in India, but part of Afghanistan and the Middle East and of course, in parts of like Central Asia. So, one can imagine that uh, this, this image, we, uh, this, this particular material which is not found in India that was also brought in, in the caves of Ajanta and those were utilized. And since those were utilized, we also see that I mean how in the representations, for example, here that we have the use of blue is there, but it is very limited and very careful. So, unlike the other colors, for example, red, black, white and green which were found very easily, blue is used very carefully. So, it, the scarcity of this material or the economic and social value of this material that adds to its utilization in this paintings. So, when we talk about the pigments, the economy of this pigment as well as uh, its social value, its cultural value that adds a lot to what will be the final outcome of its usage. So, for example, if we take this particular image as, a, as an example, then the use of blue, the very careful use of blue that was informed by the economic value as well as cultural value of lapis lazuli that says something about how that also added to the aesthetics of Ajanta paintings. Now, with that, we can we can also imagine that how how this uh, this blue is uh, used there, and um, of course that I mean how uh, those uh, materials were uh, not really very popularly uh, used in the other sites. Now, one of the reasons for that is that Ajanta, the location of Ajanta in Maharashtra that we see it today, it actually stood at the crossroads of different trade routes. So, for that reason what we have there is that uh, there are uh, traders from, from perhaps from uh, the western frontier of the Indian subcontinent as well as from Central Asia and so on. They arrived there or they sent their material to the Deccan and then the people from the southern India, they, they have also sent their material and so on. And that is the reason that the this particular material blue was available that uh, for the importance of this site of Ajanta being a very important trade. Uh, you know site. For that reason, we find that I mean this material, the blue lapis lazuli, this expensive material was made available here, which perhaps was not the case for many other sites from where we also find um, you know the image making practices utilizing the local pigments and so on. So, from there if we move little further into the images those we find in Ajanta and we find that I mean the kind of ways in which these murals are painted, they differ from the fresco technique. So, in there are a few ways in which we can see that uh, the murals are painted usually on the lime plaster and there are two major ways in which we find this, this uh, images are made. So, one will be in which the lime uh, the paint is added on the top of the fresh lime plaster 
where the lime plaster is yet not dried and that is how we have this uh, this fresh uh, you know the appearance of this paints and but it it also sort of dries out very fast and that is the reason the images need to be drawn quickly something that we find in italy and parts of southern europe now the as opposed to that what we find here in ajanta is that the lime plaster was there and the painting had started only after the lime plaster was completely dried and that is the reason what we find here the image making technique is very similar to this uh, celebrated watercolor technique of tempera in the Indian subcontinent. In the tempera technique what we find there uh, also is that how the pigments are added to a binder and sometimes with the white pigment little more and then those are applied with a dry brush or like semi dry brush on the paper surface or on the other surfaces on which uh, this these images are drawn so this this paints become slightly thick and opaque and that is how like i mean the the kind of um, the the visual effect it creates it becomes very different from a swift brush stroke or like the fresh um, you know the the application of color that can be distinguished uh, from those uh, the other counterparts in southern Europe and so on. So, when we see this kind of application that, that made uh, these paintings in Ajanta possible, so why those, those also are important for us to understand and that is because the amount of detail and the amount of um, you know not only just the detail, but also the amount of expressions and the emotion those are uh, embedded in these paintings that is something that came with much uh, dedication and time which perhaps been very different if they were drawn very quickly. So, with the swift brush strokes with the dynamism the, the expression of this emotion as well as like I mean these different situations which are depicted in this Ajanta murals would have been very different and that is the reason for us it is also important to understand the significance of these materials as well as how these materials are employed onto this surface for making the murals basically the technique of them. So, the material technique they are very important part of understanding the final outcome of this images as well as the way we appreciate them today. Now, the images that we find in the caves of Ajanta and they range from uh, various different uh, this Jataka tales to uh, the veneration of Buddha as well as like there are some of the very important Bodhisattva figures. So, this different kind of images that we find to be part of the Ajanta murals and here on screen we have one of the very celebrated images and that is the uh, and this image is popularly known as the dying princess. So, dying princess comes from the, uh, the story of Sundarananda and Nanda being this prince who, uh, who was about to marry his, um, his lover and then at the verge of it he encountered Buddha and Buddha convinced him to uh, denounce everything and become a monk this material world cannot really uh, fulfill all his um, aspirations and with Buddha's uh, advice and uh, inspired by him he uh, sent a message to his lover saying that I mean he will not be able to marry this person to, to marry her and that is the, and this is a particular scene in which we find this particular uh, person the princess Sundari she is uh, dying she she uh, apparently turned blue and she she left her um, this earthly body so that is that is the story and in which we find that i mean this entire episode this um, this sad episode is uh, depicted here with much emotion and the situation has been depicted with all this all these different figures who add to the emotion of this of this particular scene in the in the center stage we find there is the uh, the image of the princess and the princess as we see that I mean she is um, very uh, lyrical at the same time she is elegant and she, the, the way she is uh, sitting there the bends and the movement in her body they, they add to the, the dynamic quality of it. However, 
it, it also adds to um, the, her mental state, her drooping uh, uh, head and then also her drooping eyelids and her expression in the face that adds to that how uh, uh, her, her feeling after, after receiving the message that her lover had uh, abandoned her. And then what all we find that there are all these attendant figures like here and here and here. So all these attendant figures we try, we see that I mean they are, uh, they appear there with different kind of gestures and they try to attend to the needs of this dying princess and try to convince her to come back to life. However, they are also empathetic to, to uh, the princess's situation. So that is something that we find that uh, in these paintings of Ajanta, it is not just the depiction of anatomy, it is not just the, uh, the beauty standards or making things beautiful that has been prioritized, but it is also the expression, the emotion and how to convey a story with utmost care as well as to make it close to the life of the people who are encountering them. So these are some of the things we find there. And Ajanta paintings also we find a very interesting blend of uh, two things that will be um, uh, the naturalism as well as the ideal uh, standards. And so for example, by ideal standards I, I um, refer to the iconographic details of how to paint an image or how to paint an ideal woman or an ideal man. So there are certain kind of beauty standards that we find and there are different kinds of uh, references to the natural forms, for example, the stems of lotus and then the, uh, the bow as, as the eyebrows and then like I mean the, the shoulder, the a man's shoulder like a shoulder of a vrisha. So that, that is called like vrisha skandha. So all these different kind of things and they are um, you know implemented in these images. So in one hand this is the study of anatomy that we find from our surrounding and which is also effortlessly blended with this iconographical convention as well as the beauty standards which were popular during this time. And when I say the popular beauty standards, I mean that there had already been those uh, celebrated uh, poems of Ashwagosha as well as Kalidasa and so on. So in their uh, literary works, we find this kind of um, the depiction of beauty had been there. So a reflection of that we also see in these images. So uh, Ajanta sort of brings together these different modes of um, knowledge in these paintings and that is perhaps one of the ingenious things for which Ajanta paintings are even celebrated today. So this is, this is another image that I wanted to show here to give us a sense of where these images are situated and how these images, perhaps there had been images in the exterior walls of these uh, cave sites as well, but uh, for, for the weathering and uh, for like monsoon rains and so on not all those images could survive. So we have that um, and this, this also gives us a sense of like I mean how the exterior and the interior surfaces will be different in Ajanta. So this, this shows uh, the entrance facade of cave 1 in the left side and then we also have the main shrine and the vihara. So this, this particular cave, cave 1 is a vihara and uh, so in this one we have the main shrine and then there are also those individual cells around the main shrine where the uh, monks and the nuns can live. So this is the interior scene of or the interior shot from this vihara or the cave 1 in which we find that profusely drawn and painted surfaces all across and uh, we find that how the the walls are painted profusely, the columns, the pillars were also painted and then we also have traces of the paint on the ceiling as well. So there are different kinds of images, those, those we find to be part of this, this area. Now one question one might ask that if 
Buddhism started with this humble idea of having structures which are not really uh, monumental and which are not really palatial or which do not really have uh, too much of effort for, for the monks and the nuns to stay. Then in that case, how do we justify this kind of structure which, is, which are grand? So, what we know about the Ajanta uh, caves uh, that uh, these uh, caves were patronized not by uh, one person, but many people like the important merchants from royals and so on and so, something similar to what we have already seen in Sanchi and um, Barut. Now, what we have here is that the idea of uh, Punya or the spiritual merit had also been a driving force for them to have these caves made in such um, uh, in, in this careful fashion. So, the, the sculptor, the architects and so on, they, they had worked perhaps for dedicating their best work to the God and that is the reason we find all these details have been there. And similarly, the patrons who would like to have these caves excavated, they also perhaps wanted to make these caves as beautiful as possible, almost like a representation of the Buddhist heaven inside these caves. And that is the reason why we find that there have been tremendous amount of effort and of course, uh, perhaps there have been um, much of resources which are gone for making this cave site. So, for attending spiritual merit, for, uh, and th that is applicable to the patrons as well as the, the artisans who had worked for these sites. So, for them it became very important and that is the reason they had put their best effort to make these caves. So, even though the monks and the nuns are the ones who would have inhabited these caves, but uh, they also the sculptors, the painters as well as the patrons also wanted to have their best effort in these sites so that uh, they can have more of the spiritual merit granted by the Buddha. So, this is also something that we find that what were the, uh, the, the consequences of that. So, in one sentence I can say that they were able to make the, this illusion of this Buddhist paradise within these cave structures. So, Ajanta is situated at a place where we can find that which is dry in weather, only in the monsoon it, uh, it uh, receives rain and in the other times of the year it is pretty dry, the summer being really hot. And then in this place when one enters the, a monk or a nun or a, or a pilgrim, when they enter this cave site in this dark interior of the cave, once there is a lamp or, or whatever source of light, then one could see that all these paintings of this magnificent paintings, they, they are there, which is a stark contrast from what we see outside of these cave sites. And uh, so, these this paintings uh, all over the walls and on the ceilings and everywhere that makes us an illusion, that gives us an illusion of this space. Which, which is this ideal Buddhist paradise or the heaven. And that is the reason we find these images which are there which depict the, uh, the life of Buddha as well as the Jataka stories and so on. They are not just there as people to, to learn from them, but overall they also create this, um, this, um, this idea of how a Buddhist paradise might look like for, for the people who diligently follow the path of Buddha and where they are uh, going to end up in. Thank you.